This podcast is brought to you by Onnit. Go to Onnit.com and look at the great selection of supplements. If you find something you like, press in code Joey and get 10% off delivered right to your house. What's happening, you bad motherfuckers? It's Monday, the 23rd of May. Listen, the joint is brought to you by Manscaped. Are you ready to go ultra smooth? Our friends of Manscaped are here to help. Grab your handy lawnmower 4.0 for a nice trim. Then you pull out the crop exfoliator and you exfo- exfoliate around the fucking pogo stick. Then you lather up and you see you're shaving with their clear crop gel shaving gel just for the fucking groin area. And then it's time to shave. You use the crop shaver. It's designed for shaving around the fucking helmet of the cock. And all the products in the ultra smooth package are vegan, cruelty free and sulfate free no animals got kicked in the head with this experiment get 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com with code joey j-o-e-y it's summertime you want to keep that fucking area spotless if it's looking like the wolf man you're gonna jerk off to your fucking 90 nothing's gonna happen for you i'm gonna give you 20 percent off on a monday plus free shipping with code joey at manscaped.com smooth out the fucking dick area and relaunch the ultra smooth package from the fellas at manscaped.com listen i'm gonna thank you manscaped is gonna thank you but most importantly your fucking balls are gonna thank you when was the last time they said thank you about anything the joint is also brought to you by the bong of the year freeze pipe no matter if it's 100 degrees like it is today you keep your bong ice fucking cold here's how it works you freeze a portion of the bong then when you're ready to fucking smoke it, you pack it with the fucking reefer of death, the laughing gas, and then you take that pop piece out of the freezer, you pip it into your fucking bubbler or bong, whatever, and when you rip the hot smoke, passes through the frozen pipe, cooling down the smoke as you inhale. <sighs> like a bad motherfucker. Your smoke will be so cold, you think you're blowing ice cubes up people's assholes. Listen, I love freeze pipe. It takes me back to 83, snow mass. Just getting a scoop of snow and putting it in a bong. It's non-toxic. It freezes faster than water, and guess what? It stays frozen longer. It must be on blue chew. Freeze pipe cools down the smoke by hundreds of degrees. What happens is your fucking throat doesn't burn and you're living like a doctor. You can sing opera and shit. And your Uncle Joey's taking care of you on a Monday morning. Go to freezepipe.com, pressing code Joey to save 10% off your first order. Listen, I'd start off with the fucking bubbler and work yourself up to the bong, the pipe, the whole fucking thing. That's thefreezepipe.com. Pressing code Joey, J-O-E-Y, to save 10%. If you could smoke from it, freeze pipe makes it, cocksuckers. I love you. Let's get this party started on a Monday morning. Bruce Lee was the real deal. It was the real deal, though. He could fight. He could fight. fight. Yeah. That motherfucker turned the nation yeah. around. I mean, I, I grew up in the in the you know a lot of people though. Well, some people know, but I grew up in the fight game because my dad was a bus driver, obviously, for, obviously from Bronx Hill, but he also was a, uh, a professional fight trainer. And so I grew up uh, boxing, not, never professionally, never. I just trained, and you know, when I grew up, and I I didn't want to be a fighter. I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to be an actor, but my dad always said 
that you know you could you know you could be good with your hands, but if you fight a guy who's good with his a rest, you know, like a wrestler, a wrestler was the, was the toughest kind of fight in the street. In the street, yeah, in the street, a yeah. wrestler. I bounced Joey, and my son said, "You got to tell Joey that story because he's into martial arts." I said, "All right, I'll tell him." I was when I was a bouncer in 1981. I was a bouncer in uh, the Limelight in Manhattan. Wow. It was like the hottest club in England. I right? must have walked past you three you times. You must have. You had to because yeah. I used to work the door. Yeah. And the only guy, you know, I got it to some people. I was always, they called me the Perry Como because I was always like cool. Like I wouldn't like, I said, come on, relax. You don't want to fight. I was a good talker, right? But this one fucking guy got into, and I was about, I squared him up to hit him and he went down on me and he, you know, he Picked gave me up. a double, a double you know, leg. Yeah. Double leg. I'll never forget. I, I told him the story. And he got. He, I found out later he was an he was an all, all American college wrestler. He got me down on the floor, and then I remember I'll never forget it, Joey. I grabbed his shoulders to, to roll him. It was like I was picking up a building, Joey. I couldn't move. No, like he he just knew how to brace me, Joey. I was like, I felt like a child. I felt like a baby. And thank God the cavalry came, my other bouncers, and they got him. But if they didn't come. Forget it. I was getting my ass kicked, man. It's crazy the power that a wrestler has. They have a lot of strength because they, they train in endurance based. Right. And the more the years that you keep wrestling, you just get this brute strength that you can't get from weights. Weights you're, can't you're, give you that type of strength. Right. You learn to be heavy. You know, they learn how to be heavy. Yes. It's a tough thing. I, I didn't like wrestling. At that age, at 15, I didn't want to hug no guys. You know what I'm saying? I wanted to <laughs> right. play basketball. Right, but you did You did jiu-jitsu, right? I did jiu-jitsu. I joined when I was 50. 50? Yeah. Wow. And I go today. You still go? Yeah. Uh, but Gracie and Old Bridge, they have an old guy class. Wow. Every day from 12 An to old 1. guy class. There's a guy in there, Charlie. He's a gangster from Staten Island. He's, really? He's fucking 60. I asked him, Charlie, what do you do? He goes, I sell businesses. I buy and sell businesses. At 60 years old, I bet you, you better not fuck with this guy. This guy is a black belt in karate all his life. Uh, and then he started one again to jiu-jitsu when he was 55. And the other day, me and him were fucking around. Having a great time. We're both old timers. And really? I went to scissor sweep him. So I pulled him into my guard and I put my leg in between him. And I just I was ready to scissor sweep him. He didn't budge. <laughs> he didn't fucking budge, guys. <laughs> right. All the technique in the world because you got to put that weight on top of yours. Right. He's a big Italian dude. And I went to sweep him, nothing. It was like pushing against the wall. And the lady told me he was a wrestler. Yeah. Because I wrestled in college. Because I dropped it, you know, after college. Yeah. But I picked it up again with jujitsu. But like what a, you said is an interesting thing. That even way, it's like they get that brute, they get that strength in their strength. hands. It's a different the grip strength. strength, you know? It's a different strength. It's funny because I joined jujitsu because I was sick and tired of watching people watch stuff and like put down jujitsu. I wanted to make sure I knew what I was talking about. Right. You know, I wanted to make sure I understood it. And I went to Vegas with Rogan one time, and that was when McGregor was going to fight Diaz the first time. Right. And I'll never forget that Diaz. He squint, Diaz went like this, and McGregor squinted. <laughs> and I went and I thought about it all night. Like I, after the after the weigh-in, I bet like maybe twenty bucks. Yeah. Just to watch the fight, and then I went up to my room and I started thinking about it. I'm like, Diaz is a jujitsu guy. Right. All his life from the beginning. That's and, a yeah. different strength. That's a different strength. Right. That's a different endurance level. I go, you know what? I'm going to bet D. I never forget calling my wife and going, put money in the ATM account. And she's like, for what? What? What are you? I go, just, I'll show you. Mm -hmm. I bet like a thousand on Diaz. I couldn't believe it. He probably got good odds, too. Yeah, right? No, he beat him. I remember that. He, he beat, beat him. him. He yeah. beat him. Yeah, because he choked him out. He choked him out because yeah. that was the only reason I bet him. I can tell you other, that, that's the only reason because that discipline. You can't. It's you right. can't take that. For he does. Life. He's a, he he actually. Dante, tell Joey who you uh, wrestled with. No, I can't, I can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, my my old uh, jujitsu trainer was really close with the Gracies. Okay. And Hoist came in and did like a small class, and we all got to spar him when I was like eleven. How was it? It was the most insane thing ever. He like you know he let us get him in like right, a choke yeah. and he tapped out. We're like ah, ah, <laughs> And he, he just showed us like some fundamentals, and it was well, it was pretty wild well, to, to roll with. You, you, it's crazy. It's crazy. Joey, you remember when they had the uh, when they had the the, the, the tournament? 
you know, it was like uh, he used to win all the time in the beginning, Hoist Gracie. Hoist Gracie. And the then everybody kind of just caught up. Caught and, up to him. Yeah. Yeah. Jiu-Jitsu was very special. But now, you grew up in New York. I grew up in the you Bronx. you remember the, yeah. the martial arts thing they did at the Garden every year? No, I don't. They used to have a martial arts thing every year. Aaron Banks, little hippie dude from New York, right. Jewish guy, I think he was. You know, he had a fucking all-day tournament. And it ended with a guy... They got. They shot him with a twenty-two, and they bu- bit the bullet out of the air. And how he would do it was, they put a glass in front of him. You can see this on YouTube. This ain't news. You put a glass in front of him. <laughs> Some little French guy would come out and shoot. It would break the glass, and then he would time the bullet when it hit the glass. No, I don't know. He died. He died. He eventually got shot. <laughs> <laughs> but eventually, the bullets got the because it was a twenty-two. He must right. have gone for like a fucking right. nine millimeter. And he had a special jaw they made, like a. a and he catched the bullet. He catched the bullet and then spit it on a frying pan because it was hot. And he did it on Why World of Sports. So like Fuck. two or three Saturdays in a row. And what you could do, Mike, put that insert in, like show them whatever they they have it on YouTube. Wow. What Wide World of Sports. Well, you, I remember the Wide World of Sports. I absolutely. That. So that's the like, agony of defeat. That oh guy my was God. Going, Boom, bang. And they don't have that show on anymore. They don't. No. Which baffles me because it was such a great. Everybody was home right. Saturday at five, and even if you didn't, even if they were playing ping pong, you didn't give a fuck. It was the guy falling from skiing. Right, the that guy. You did not want to miss you that. You wanted to miss it. That dude falling, breaking his neck and bouncing, <laughs> the agony of defeat, defeat. and all I that mean, shit. I mean, that guy's got to be, I don't know if he's still alive. That no, guy. he got defeated. That he is the agony. Right. That's defeat right there. Wow. If he great. lost an arm, that dude, something. He lost something in that accident. Right. There was bodies bouncing and shit, and they weren't, you know, there was no woke culture. Nobody right, got right, pissed right, off. Right, right. <laughs> wow. That's right. Uh, that's it's so, so cool, weird, uh, a fact that people don't know. I Googled this years ago. Do you motherfuckers know how many famous people came out of the Bronx? Yeah. You'll never count the amount. There's yeah. something in the water in the Bronx. If I could do you know what it is? It's that leftover fucking fried banana juice that they put in the sink. That shit goes right into oh, the Bronx are River. You're from the Bronx originally? My mother had a bookmaking operation. She had a quality cleaners. It was on Tremont Avenue. Yeah. Up there, I remember I used to go up there and I used to get chased by the the Royal Javelins. Right. There was a bunch of street gangs and I would yeah. just go to buy Italian ice on the corner. That was my first real experience with Italian people. On the corner, there was a guy that would make uh, sherbet. Sherbet, yeah. And you put 7-Up in it. Right. Fucking lose. Bronx had shit you never tasted right. before. You know, wow. they had those candy stores that they'd make you the egg creams. Yeah. And the fucking pizza was to die for. But then we got rid of it like in 71, and then right. I used to go to the Bronx and do Santeria stuff, or right. like to eat fried bananas and pork chops, because nobody makes a fucking pork chop like a Puerto Rican. I don't give a fuck what anybody tells you. That skinny pork chop <laughs> skinny, yeah. with some red beans and fried rice and oh, fried bananas. I, I love red beans and Oh, fried my God. When I used to have, uh, I used to you know, date these Puerto Rican girls, and they would make me uh, aras con pollo, which I loved. I, that was one, that's how I got introduced to Puerto Rican food. And I, I love, love all that shit. I loved all that shit. I love, yeah, I love growing up in the Bronx. People always go, "How did you, you know, your childhood must have been really rough?" And I go, "It really wasn't. I got, I got. It was a beautiful childhood. I loved it. It really was. I mean, did I see some violent things? I mean, obviously, I wrote Bronx Tale from the killing that I saw when I was sitting on my stoop. But I had a great childhood. I, I can't complain about it. I really can't. I don't want people to think I lived in this drug infested area. No, it, it was an Italian neighborhood. Everybody was Italian. Everybody hung out. Everybody stuck together. Nobody locked their doors. Was there violent shit that happened? Yes. But I loved growing up there, man. You know, I just, I loved growing up there. I can't help it, man. It's yeah. a real life. When I would go up there as a child, I looked at it as a real life. I even went to the, the boys' club. Because we were there, the there boys one club summer, there. yeah. And my mother put me in the camp at the boys' club. That's the first time I realized I was a failure because I couldn't pass the test to get the president's exam. You got to do like 50 push ups, 50 sit ups. Yeah. And I couldn't do the pull ups, cocksuckers. Right, right. I couldn't do the pull ups. So yeah, pull ups are hard, man. Pull ups were hard. And right. they used to give us like a little box lunch. And I, I just remember the pizza. Oh, the if pizza. I really got to remember something from the Bronx in those days was how the cheese just dripped and right. the fucking. The flavor, I never got that again. It was just, that's why I learned how to eat all that stuff. And the sandwiches, wet mutts, fucking tremendous. Oh, mutts. You're like Italian. Fucking, dog, I grew, I ate that (laughs) shit. 
from the what? time I was four to like six, yeah. and then it got taken away from me. And then I was back in New York City, eating Puerto Rican food, pizza, yeah. all that shit. And then my mom had a bar in Union City. Right. So I would have to go visit her. And then finally one day she goes, we're moving to Jersey. I can't take the commute no more. Yeah. So we moved to a town called North Bergen. And what happened in North Bergen in the early 70s, it was the influx from the Italians in Hoboken who were now got like good jobs. They yeah. Were moving up. It's like moving on up. The Jeffersons moved up to the Brooklyn right. and got a house. You move out of the Brooklyn projects. Brooklyn went to Jersey. Brooklyn You're went right. to Jersey. That's right. Uh, boy, uh, Bronx went to Westchester. Yes. Yes. So it was funny that how I never really had Italians around me again to 73. I went back to North Bergen and North Bergen, and I, I didn't know those Italian people I was raised with were very special. That era of Italian were very special, and I couldn't put my fucking finger on it. What made these, like, we won the States when I was in the eighth grade. My high school won the fucking number one seed, Whoa. and not one kid was over 5'8". The names were Avillo and Rick really? Capozzi, and, and there were these little fire plugs. And they ran behind the high school with helmets in 90-degree weather to get better. They, were, they brought the Italian work ethic to football, yeah. and they became this team. And then I watched the HBO thing on Sinatra, and that's why I put it all together. I always tell people I was raised by Hoboken Italians because pretty much everybody I hang out with, from the Barones to Messinas, right. the Lanos, they're right. all from Hoboken. It's said that those Hoboken Italians used to get tortured by the Irish. Yeah. They were not allowed to go up, up by 9th Street. They weren't allowed to pass 9th Street, the Irish. You can't tell Italian people not to walk past 9th Street. <laughs> yeah. So they probably had so much anger. Then yeah. they moved up to North Bergen, and that anger got passed on to me because I grew up with them. Yeah. But it was a, and now yeah. I had my own anger from being a revolutionary Cuban. Then remember right. my house, when you walked in, they had a picture of Fidel with blood coming out of his head next to fucking Jesus, you know? Wow. Because the pre-revolutionary Cubans <laughs> hate Fidel. They were first generation. Right, they, hate they got their shit taken that's from right, them. That's right, that's right. So they would cry, right. they would fucking go, we're gonna kill that motherfucker. So here I had these anti, that these Italians that were held back, and here right. I'm coming from an anti-revolutionary house, it's a perfect fucking combination in heaven. For anger. For anger and throwing things and robbing trains and fucking lighting bowls on fire. Like a lady in, in our neighborhood had a little bowl in the house with goldfish. Every uh, night we put liquid fire on it and light it on fire. We burned the fucking goldfish. Oh, Every God. morning the chick had fish and chips for breakfast. I mean, it, was, oh, it was fucking crazy, you know, and I learned that heart that they had. And even now... I've moved back here now to Jersey, and there's a lot of Staten Island Italians. I've been here two years. I've not heard the language of Italian. You haven't? No. Wow. These generations didn't pass that the, language. No, we didn't that, do it. See, my mother and father, they said, hey. Piss me the we're fuck Ameri off. We're Americans now. We don't speak that language. And my mother did the same thing. They my did mother, that to me. My mother also said, outside, you got to speak English because you're an American. Right. In here, we're still Cuban. See, my kids, he's learning Italian. My daughter speaks Italian. My wife speaks Italian. All three, except me. I'm the only one. I'm the only one. Fucking believe that? You it's didn't terrible. take it in high school? Nothing like yeah, that? Yeah, but I, you know, I was terrible in high school. I, when I went to Bronx Community College, I'm, I, you know, I went to the community college. I started learning. I started applying myself to really, to better myself. Well, when I was in high school, I just wanted to fuck with my own girls you know, fuck around with my friends. You know, it was terrible. And you, know. you went to college. What did you major in? Did you even? Drama. Did you? Yes. Oh, I always wanted to be an actor. Okay. Always, even when I was like 10, 11. 10, 11 years old, because I saw, um, I, I remember my mother used to take me to the movies, and I saw um, Marlon Brando in, uh, you know, years a few years after it came out, I saw it on TV. My mother showed me Marlon Brando on the waterfront, which was my best movie of all time for me. And I just always wanted to be an actor. I just always wanted to be an actor. And I wanted to write. I used to write poetry back then. I wrote lyrics for a song, for songs. And I just, I knew what I wanted to do, and that was it. And you were part of a musician also? I was a singer in the band. I wasn't a musician, no. Okay. No. But I would write lyrics. I had a hit song on the, uh, the R&B charts. It went to number 28. A group called, uh, uh, the song was Meet the Beat. I can't remember the group, they're the old black group that did it. I just can't remember them, but for RSO Records. But it went to 28, didn't make any money, I got fucked out of it, you know, but that's all right. <laughs> you know, back then they just said, yeah, give him a fucking cheese sandwich, you know. And so uh, I didn't do that, but uh, 
No, but the, but I, I enjoyed writing. I always wrote. I always write short stories and things. And then obviously what happened was when I when I couldn't make it anymore, but it's everybody knows the story. I wrote Bronx Tale. Um, and my career just took off. It just exploded, you know, it just fucking exploded. Did you see it coming? No. I wrote Bronx Tale to get an agent. I had to get an agent. I just <laughs> No, 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 not at all. No, no. I I just said I got to get noticed. I got fired. I was working at this fucking club bouncing because I ran out of money. I guess when I got to L.A., I, I hit it. I mean, I got hot for about a year and a half. Hill Street Blues, Dallas. Um, you know, I did a couple of, bunch of shows. I did a TV movie. And then I ran out of money. I started running out of money again. And finally, I, I was working at a door, and this guy comes over to me, and he really snobby motherfucker. He treated me like, he goes, come on, you go, don't you know who I am? And when, when I work a door, and you tell me, don't you know who I am? That's like the kiss of fucking death. I said, yeah, you're the guy who's not getting in tonight. That's who. And he goes, you'll be fired in 15 minutes. And I said, fuck you, I'll be fired. 15 minutes later... The man comes, the owner comes out because he, uh, he was making a slip. Who was it? Swifty Lazar. Swifty Lazar was the biggest agent in the world. And I just told him he can't come into his own party. It was his party. That's why he wanted to get in there. And I got fired and I went home. And I, in North Hollywood, I was this fucking dump. I was a shitty apartment, shitty car. And I wrote, uh, I said, I'll write this. I'm going to write about this killing. And I just wrote five minutes of it. Then I performed it from my theater workshop. And then everybody loved it. And then I would write during the week and I would perform it on Monday. And people would comment. They tell me, people would say what they liked, what they didn't like. And I feel, and I recorded it all on cassettes. And it was great, Joey, because I had a lot of feedback from a lot of people. You know, I would say, all right, this works, that works, this doesn't work. And after a year, I had this 90 minutes of a one man show. And then my friend lent me money, and my fucking career just busted. Like, like, I literally went from, you know, I had, I had credits as an actor, Broadway credits, but I didn't, and nobody knew me, and then I just, boom, starring at the movies with, you know, Robert De Niro. And it was pretty crazy, man. But it was like the legend story. I turned it down. They offered me a... 250000 I said, no, I want to play Sonny. I want to write this screenplay. They said, no, no, fuck, not happening. I said, all right, forget it. Then they offered me 500 I said, no. Then they offered me $1 million. I had $200 in the bank, swear my mother and father. And I said, I want to play Sonny. I want to write this screenplay. And the guy said to me, we can't make this money. We can't make this movie with you, Chaz, because Pacino wanted to do it. Nickel they all wanted to do it. And I said, no. And then finally, two weeks later, I did the show. You, did you ever see the one man show? No. No, you got to come and see it. I, well, yeah. I did it, and I got off the stage, and the guy walks over to me, and, and he says, Hey, Robert De Niro's in your dressing room. You just saw the show. And I said, Robert De Niro? I, I, he goes, Yeah. I went in the dressing room, there was Bob De Niro. And, he's, and he said, Man, uh, he goes, I fucking one man. He goes, You did a movie on stage. He goes, That's amazing. I said, Oh, thanks, Bob. He goes, Look, if you fucking sell this thing eventually, they're going to come to me anyway. So he goes, let me tell you how I feel. He goes, you should play Sonny. You should write the screenplay because it's your life and it'll be honest. He goes, I'll play your father and I'll direct it. And if you shake my hand, that's the way it'll be. I shook his hand and that was it, man. Boom. Oh, I took off. What are the fucking odds of that, right? So, But it was pretty incredible. It was pretty amazing. And that's what happened. I still remember walking out of that movie. I was just getting into comedy. I got into comedy in 91. And you're searching. You know, the first year you're imitating Dice Clay. Yeah, it's you're true. You're imitating Kennison. I got no, I'm not stealing their jokes. Right. I'm using their character. Right. You know, you're just trying to feel your world. Right. I'm doing Kennison one week. I'm doing Dice the other week. You're doing Eddie Murphy one week. Yeah. I went back to prior, you know, that style of, you know, sure. talking about drugs. One week you're talking about pussy. And you and I used to wear a suit like Lenny Clark. You're trying to find your voice. You have to find, it takes about two years to find your voice. So true. And I come to New York. I'm out of money in Boulder. I, I'm divorced. I, I'm, I'm out. I mean, I'm just out. And I right. call my brother, come to Sea Caucus, stay here. And I start hustling in the city. And it's, uh, I start doing spots in the city, and I'm getting spots. I'm okay, you know. And one night I had nothing to do, and I went to Guttenberg, to the fucking Galaxy 
building there on a Saturday night, and I walked in to see your movie. God's honest truth. Yeah. When did that movie come out? 93 or 94. I saw it in like 93. Yeah. It had to be 93, August, October, yeah, September. Yeah, right Because I left New York in October. Because wow. by watching your movie, it gave me a plan. First of all, between me and you, I was going to shoot you. Because I felt you stole my idea. Because my mother died and I got raised by Italians. So somewhere in Do my... Do you know how many people have said that to me? You know how many people said you... St I had comics say to me, what was that comic's name? I think he passed away recently. He said, you stole my fucking act. You stole my fucking act. Big Petey, Louis Petey, Fat Joey. Oh, Dom Herrera used to say. No, it wasn't Dom. Dom it okay. wasn't Dom because I, lo I love Dom. He's great. I can't think of the guy's name. But he told people, you told that guy I'm suing that motherfucker. And I said, you know what? Fucking sue me. Leave me alone. I mean, well, every, every Italian neighbor, there was always a fat guy, a small a guy, yeah. a, a big guy. You know what I mean? Every, everybody thinks, you know, Steven Spielberg said one thing. I'll never forget it. He said, success, he goes, failure, he goes, success has one father. Failure is an orphan. You know, when he, every movie he ever said he made, somebody fucking, he, they stole your idea. So you, you just deal with that. You go, all right, yeah, fucking sue me. Whatever you want to But do. I, didn't, I didn't, in my mind, I wasn't going to sue you. I just left going, this is the story I got to tell. This is the type of comic I have to be. Right. I have to tell my story from a sympathetic way. It's such a great movie because it's got so much heart. At the end, when he meets Joe Pesci and the right. whole thing, I mean, the, the movie has so many fucking things. But when I met, I left that movie, I didn't have a car. I got no reason to lie to know, but I didn't have a car. I probably had $8 in my pocket and I Whoa. walked home going, now I have a direction. Jesus, you really? I, I have a direction where to take this. I know that what I have in my heart, the story I have in my heart to tell is going to work from watching your story. Yeah. When I became a comic, I was dirty, I was older, so nobody really dug me. But I always knew in the back of my mind, if I got a chance to tell my story, I'm going to eat these motherfuckers up alive. I got to tell my story and how it connects and what happened. As soon as I, I used to watch uh, those boxing things. Inside the HBO, you know, yeah. inside. Yeah. Before somebody's going to fight. Right. Yeah, 24-7. Uh, 24-7. I might hate you, Dante. I'm talking to Dante Palmer. I might hate you, Dante. But I watched I'm going to bet your father against you in that fight. But because that show showed me your house. It showed me your wife. It showed me your child. It showed me your pool. It's not just you. I'm going to kill him. My right's yeah. a great punch. I'm a bad Italian stallion. No. I got to see the real Dante. Right. So I always knew if I could open my heart up. And that's what happened with you. Yeah. You got to open what was in your heart. Yes. And then the fucking, and you got to stop the calls. Oh, my you God. You got to stop the call. Forget it. I ain't got a heart. I right. lied. Yeah. You got, no, yeah. I don't know nothing. If I don't you know say, Little right. Petey. If you say I don't know nothing about here. Little Petey. When right. you say this, yeah. when this comes into the whole thing and you put it on the stage. That's it. And there's a difference between killing like making people laugh, right? And the difference between leaving your heart on stage, right? Jesus right. Christ, when you leave your heart, and that's why I can't do comedy no more, because I'm 60. I'm gonna die. When I go on stage, it's like I tell a joke now. Right. I didn't realize this until I moved back to Jersey. When we were kids, right? I want you to think about this. We look at your son. When right. We were kids. We didn't go out to play. We went out to die. Yeah. When we were 12, you went out to die because that's your right. friend said to you, "I got a go kart with no brakes." <laughs> Go, go, come on. Yes, we're going downhill. We're no going, helmets. Yes, yes. Nobody was allergic to peanuts. There was no elbow braces. You know, right? You know, we went out to die. You know, people say, "What is the difference of friendship today as a friendship when we grew up?" And here's what I say, because I, I really, I kind of dissected it one day. I was thinking about it because somebody was. I had to speak about it on a show. Well, I was working. I did a thing with Michael Francis. And who I love. You've seen his podcast. Uh, Michael Francis, who is with the Colombo family. Yes, yeah. yes. Who's just wonderful and brilliant. He's got a great podcast. And, and he, I was a guest on his podcast. He became a guest on my podcast. But, but anyway, I said to him once, I said, the difference, Michael, is what is the essence of what makes people remember each other forever as friends? Combat. You could be in a war with a guy. Think about that. And then maybe you don't see him for 20 years. But if you were in Vietnam with him or if you were in World War II, when you see each other, there's a fucking brotherhood there. You were in war together. Okay, so take that down a few levels, obviously, a lot of levels. When we grew up in the street, just like you said, when your friends 
We were like fucking brothers. We bled for each other. We fucking died for each other. We fought for each other. It was no online or play date. It was like walk down the street. You had 20 fucking guys. You hung out together. Hey, this crew's coming here. Fuck that crew. You know, and you fought together. It was like a brotherhood. So that's what cemented our friendship. I'm still friends with all these guys for 20, 40 years. We have dinner once, once a year, every year. We have dinner in my house once a year. A lot of guys all pissed, passed on now, but that's what, that was the difference, Joey. The kids today, they don't have that, Joey. I've noticed since I've been back to <clears throat> Jersey that the friendships I developed 40 years ago, I'm, we're still friends. You're still friends. There's still what I, friends. There, there you go. But 40 years has passed. Yes between us and I could see that but when we get on the phone it's like nothing it's like frickin' frack again you know it's, it's right it's a really brilliant thing and that's why I moved here because I wanted my daughter to have that yes in California she would have never had that growing up they just come and go in California they come and go here like I said she's very happy. she's a different child because of the shit she's made the friends she's uh, made how, but how great is that that's what your job is as a father is to give your children a life is to make them, to give them, to show them, hey, man, there's, there's more than this than out there. You know what I, I mean? I try to protect my children. I try to do as best as I can, but I try to teach them the street, too, as much as I could. But obviously, they're not, they didn't have the life that we have, but, and good. That and they, that's they, good. And, and that's, that's good. good. So let them learn it a little later, and that's okay by me. That's how I feel, you know. You know, I look at my daughter. I said it the other night on stage. My daughter's nine. She got no fucking resume. None. Right. She knows how to play softball. That's it. When I was nine, I ran numbers. I exactly. You look out. You know what I'm saying? You were a lookout. I was a lookout. Right. I went to the Bronx on Saturday. Right. You think like when I would tell my mom, Mom, Saturday I want you to drive me to Little League. Ain't no Little League. Lewis is paying you $50 to run numbers and get sandwiched <laughs> for the guys on Saturday. And if the number yeah. hits, you get fucking 75 You know, that's yeah. what I did in the Bronx. And they switch operations every week. You got to go to a different address. Exactly. It's fucking tremendous. I will never, I cannot be mad at my mother for that lifestyle. Right. I mean, when he was nine years old, ten, almost 10, he was because I was almost 10, I looked at him and I looked at my wife and I said, John, just look at Dante. I said, I was that age when I saw that man kill a man. I said, if that happened to him right now, I would be devastated. 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 You know, I was I was. 15, I was 15, and, the, and, the, and this guy, uh, oh, he's dead now. Little Sally ran a fucking uh, a hula joint, you know, on top of the, the card games. And I would go up there, and he'd go, hey, come here, get me some cigarettes, go, go. And I would go, go get us some sandwiches at, at, at Butchie's Deli. I would go get sandwiches. And finally, they would give me tips. And one, one of them, he looked at me, looked, I'm 15, Joe, he goes, he goes, hey, see, call me, see. He goes, hey, see, uh, you want a tip or you want? One of the girls. And I was like, what? He said, no, no. You know. He goes, oh, I'll never forget her name. Her name was Foxy. Foxy! Foxy, come here. Take care of the kid. Just like that. I'll never forget it. And I was like, I just looked at him. He said, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, I walked in, right, you know, and she, I'll never forget it, you know. She took care of me, of course, right? Fuck a man, every day I'm going back. Yo, Butch, what, you, you want to say what you say? <laughs> You want anything to say? My treat. My, don't worry about it. My treat. I was fucking back there every day. I never forgot it, man. Every day. And now you go to jail. Oh, throw yeah. that chicken jail. And don't, like I, 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 I was friend, fifteen. I, I have a little kid around the corner. He's like six, and he's always bugging me. But I see him looking at women. And I told the mother, I go, do you see this kid? He looks at women when they walk by. She goes, I know. She goes, last time when he was four, he used me as a wingman <laughs> to go talk to a chick. So I know he's he's already thinking of women. So I asked him the one day, I go, how's that hammer doing? He's like, huh? He didn't even know what I was talking about. So I go, let me leave it there. Yeah. Because this is not 2020. I had a guy at my mother's bar. His name was Arnaldo. Yeah. Arnaldo Do Campo, a fat little Cuban dude that right. was a daily bookmaker. Right. And every day he'd say, Coco, come here. You pissing sweet yet? What? Are you pissing sweet yet? Because in Cuban, the term is mad dulce. Is your piss sweet yet? Wow. And I would go, what the fuck are you talking about? And then right. he'd always say, Joey, Coco, you get your dick sucked yet? And I would go, what are you talking Like, from the time I was seven. Right. You were in jail for that to today. The oh, yeah. You don't throw you under the fucking jail. Under chair. the fucking jail. And he said in front of my mother, Jose Antonio, you get your dick sucked today? Leave me alone. You know, with yeah. the whole thing. And I'll never forget when I was like 17 once, I saw him at a bar. 
right, in Union City. And I'm like, I'm not. I gave him a hug. And he's telling me, like, he goes, you look good. He goes, you jerking off. Oh. And I'm like, I don't know. You oh, know? Like, man. I'm 17. Now, he's at this bar, and he's in a chair. All right? And he's talking to me. And there's stools. You know, like Mike's got a stool. They're all on the bar. And he's talking to me. Me and my Because Union City right there was where we catch the bus to go into the into Manhattan. Right. So right by Union City is a post office. It's the last stop on that side. On right. Lincoln Tunnel. So I would go to 29th, get a hot dog from the sap bread guy there, and then take the bus into right. the city. So I the, I forget the name of that bar. I went in there, and he's in there in the afternoon, you know. And he goes, you jerking off? You look good. He goes, you got to jerk off. He goes, I'm married 30 years. I jerk off every day. And he was sitting in a chair like this. And he goes, I go home at night. I wait for my wife to take a shower. And when she's in there, I start fucking... <sighs> And he's doing this like he's living. He's going, ah, aye, aye. And he's just, he ain't jerking off, but he's going through the noises. He's going, aye, oh, aye. God. And he goes, and I switch hands. And then I do a cappuccino. And then when I come, he goes, bah. And he just jumped backwards. The chair went down. And he's like, bah, 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 bah. That's the explosion between his legs. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? And then when I was 13, I was swapping spit with a girl in my room. And my mother, Cuban mother, would say, Jose Antonio, you got to leave the fucking door open. You got to leave the door. And you know when you're 13. Right, right, right. You try to crack it. You try to, but the door is fucking open. Yeah. You can't There's do an that. inch. I mean open. I want <laughs> air to blow it. You know, my mom was one of those. Huh? <laughs> so she came home one day with Arnardo and my stepfather. They were going to barbecue. And I'm in the bedroom with him. So I go, shut up. We got to find out what he's doing out there. So Arnardo goes, I got it. So he gets a ladder. And he puts it at the side of the building. And I hear something. I'm dry humping to the earth, wind, and fire. <laughs> Fucking, you know, I'm just, I'm, there was no right. sex. No, was, yeah, yeah. Not, not even a tit. We were in the sixth grade just dry humping. Yeah. And all of a sudden I hear boom, boom. I'm like, what the fuck? And all of a sudden I hear boom. Ah, uh, the fucking ladder went down. He <laughs> broke his leg. They had to take him to the hospital. I go, what the fuck happened? And I, they tried to hide it from me. I not do walking up the stairs to see what you were going to fucking do. But it's funny how those are the characters that we talk about yeah. in our lives. Because you, can't, you can't, can't make those people up. You can't up. make this shit up. You can't make those people up. You know, Eddie Mush. That was Eddie Mush in the movie in Bronx Tale. That was Eddie Mush. He was a, you know, he was, Bob said, we got to go find this fucking guy. And we went up to my neighborhood and we cast Eddie Mush in Bronx Tale. That's him. <laughs> this fucking guy, he was so bad luck. That the bookmakers would not take his bet no more. Now, you would say, why wouldn't they take his bet? He always lost. I'll tell you the reason why. Because all the fucking guys would wait to see who he bet. And they would bet the other way. So the book, he was killing the fucking bookmakers. They said, Eddie, you can't fucking, you can't, we can't take your fucking action no more. This is how bad this fucking now guy was. Now, is Mush passed? Mush passed. Okay. Yeah. The horses. Now, hold on one second. If we get another Bronx Tale 2, yeah. Mush is going to be Lee. <laughs> yes, you know that it. motherfucker called me the other night. He's like, God damn it. Out of nowhere. He calls me like at 8 o'clock. God damn it. God damn it. I'm like, Lee, what? He goes, you motherfucker. He goes, I would have bet the Celtics tonight, but you always tell me I'm mush, so I bet the Sixers. Oh, you told him that? Yeah. No, we, since we saw the movie, we've been calling him mush. Oh, God. Lee Syed is the original. I can't even, I don't even want to, when there's a uh, UFC, I don't even want him on my phone call. Yeah. Because that call, that yeah, wire, is right. bad luck. I don't even want him on the well, wire. Oh, yeah. That was like that. He was I like would that. not talk to him before I put a bet in. I don't even want to hear his bets. Because they're going to fuck my thinking up. If he would yeah. tell me, I'm like, ah, the Celtics tonight. That's it. I'm, That's not, it. Even, yeah. I'm not even going on draft. Bush was so bad. He, he always tells this story. And it's a true story. You say, nah, come on, Chaz. You're exaggerating. He had two horses that finished first that he bet. One, jockey fell off 10 yards before the fucking finish line. So you disqualified. Once you fall off, because yeah. he, jockey, he got hit. Jockey fell, fell off the horse. The other one was uh, Trotters. Yanka Trot. Horse gets a fucking heart attack and dies halfway around. <laughs> <laughs> and you would say, bullshit, <coughs> bullshit. I'll tell you another, okay, when Mush died, a friend of Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church, okay, when he came out, we all people went to the, the funeral. When he came out, they carried the fucking coffin, they put the coffin in the hearse. Joey, a fucking flat on the hearse. <laughs> <laughs> so now they can't, you know, jack it up. But thank God, the, uh, it was Joe Body funeral Paul. They had another hearse. They had to come there, bring that one. They took the hearse. Everybody in the front of the church is going, you fucking believe this? Even in debt? 
<laughs> and on his tombstone it says, Eddie Mush Montanero, the original Bronx Tale. You know what? I, I love doing it for him because he made the guy famous, you know? Fucking, and he did. And these guys made us famous. Yes, by they us did. Talking about him. Fucking Mush. By us fucking talking. I have a friend that I grew up with. He's past. Buck Wild, Italian kid, Darren Rago, five foot six, two hundred pounds, wow. bodybuilder. Yeah. You know, he came to my house one day. He goes, "Can I tell you a secret?" I go, "Yeah." He goes, "Hold on one second. He starts doing push-ups. <laughs> Why are you doing push-ups? You know, he takes his shirt off. You're on steroids in, in high school. So this went on for years, and then you know his mother died, and everything got a little fucked up, and he got fucked up with the drugs. So when I'm talking to a buddy, my Mikey Askelis, and he goes, "I got to tell you a Darren story." I go, "What?" He goes. Darren came to Hoboken. You know, he was working at this club called Shooter's Galleria. Yeah. He goes, Darren came down. All of a sudden, the, the buzz went off like an alarm. He goes, I see Darren, but I don't think, you know, I go, Darren, how you doing? And he goes, I see Darren. He goes, I forget all about Darren. There's an alarm. Something's going on in the building, like a fight or something. So he goes, people are running around. I don't know what happened. He goes, Darren comes over, he, no shirt on, in a disco, in a club. And he gives him a 20, but it's ripped. He goes, Darren, he goes, Mike, give me a drink. He goes, Darren, the 20's ripped. How's that ripped? He goes, just give me a fucking drink. You know, we grew up together. Mike gives him a drink. He goes, he took the 20, and he asked him for Scott's tape. He goes, you got any Scott's tape? Mike goes, I'll get it. Come back in 10 minutes. He goes, within 10 minutes, guess who comes down? The bathroom attendant. He's bleeding from everywhere. Darren jacked him up in the bathroom for Coke money. The reason why the bills were ripped because the guy was holding on to his money and Darren ripped the fucking money from him. You know, those people, they don't make them no more. They don't make them no more. They don't want to make those Characters people. Characters no like that. There was this fucking legendary story in my day with this guy, Mike. He was a tough guy. Tattoos all over him. But this is, you know, early 60s. And they said, you know, we heard that Mike is gay. I said, no, get the fuck out of here. They said, I'm telling you, this guy's hanging around. People, the neighborhood's talking about Mike's gay. I said, no. I said, are you sure? And everybody starts talking about it. So I'm on a fucking, I'm on Florida Road once, and I got to get up to Alexander's, where Alexander's was, and I'm waiting for the bus. And it's raining like crazy, and a car pulls up in a green 61 Mustang. I'll never forget it. And he goes, yo, Chaz, come on in. He goes, I'll, I'll give you a lift. Where are you going? I said, I'm going up to you know, Alexander's on Fordham Road. He goes, oh, come on, I'll give you a lift. It's pouring. In my mind, I'm going, yeah, no, it's all right. I know the guy from the neighborhood. So I get in the fucking car. He's older than me. So we're driving up, and he goes, ah, fuck, man. You hear that? I go, hear what? He goes, something's with the car. So he pulls over, and he pulls over by the Botanical Gardens. You know, he pulls over on a side street. Now, in my mind, I'm going, nah. Can't be, right? So he gets out of the fucking car, opens up the fucking hood, and he's standing there with his hand on the hood like this, looking down at the engine. I wait one minute, two minutes, three minutes. I go, what the fuck's he doing? So I get out of the car. I go, hey, Mike, what's going on? He goes, could I blow you? I went, what? <laughs> he goes, could I blow I said, what the fuck? I said, are you fucking crazy? And this was a tough fucking guy. I said, oh my, sh I said, I said, what the fuck I'm going to do? I said, this guy might kick my fucking ass and force me. So I said, hey, pal, take me the fuck home. I said, no, just get, he goes, oh, I swear to God, I'm sorry. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. He goes, just get back in the car. I'll drop you off up there. I right, get back in the car. I drive. He goes, listen, don't just tell anybody. I said, all right. As we, uh, I couldn't write this. I'm getting out of the car, right? He goes, Chaz. Please don't tell nobody. I said, I won't. He goes, I'm sorry, man. He goes, there's only two things I like to do in this world, fight and suck. I said, all right, Mike. Well, listen, man, I appreciate that. Thanks for telling me that. I got out of the fucking car. I couldn't write a scene like that. What are the fucking odds that? And he was a tough guy, a fucking tough, but he was gay. He was fu but nobody would say nothing because I said, I ain't telling nobody. And I didn't until finally it came out. Everybody knew that. Oh, my God. Since yeah. you said something before, I want to ask you to see what you're hearing, because I just caught the tail end of it. What is going on? Yeah, with Mikey Franchise and Sammy. What is what? What's going on with Mikey Franchise and Sammy? And Sammy? No, I don't. Sammy. Oh, Sammy. They're at war. Yeah. Something happened. I don't know what happened. I I don't know what happened, but I I did this thing with him. But I I wasn't obviously I wasn't in the middle when they were there, but. 
I, I heard they just had some bad words with each other. I don't know. I don't know what happened because I wasn't there when they filmed it. But uh, I don't know. I really don't know. Yeah, it's not good. It's, it's been on a lot. They've been fighting. I don't know what it's about. I just saw a clip that Sammy said, and that was it. Sammy's doing a good job with the podcast. Yeah. I know he would. He's a good storyteller. Yeah, he is a good. And, he's, and it's, good. it's real is real. Yeah, he's real. He's yeah. a real dude. So I'm happy that he's doing a podcast. I think he's shooting a movie. Yeah, I think if I had to, if I had to guess, and, I, and this is truly a guess, I think there's some animosity between them because Sammy feels like he's a he's a he's a gangster, and Michael was a racketeer. Where it was a difference where Michael, right. you know, I, I so I think there's some resentment there. I could be wrong, so I really don't know really what happened. But I don't know Sammy. I never met Sammy, but I know Michael really well. In fact, him and I are going to do a podcast together, our own podcast aside from my own. But he's just a fucking great guy. I love the guy, and I, I think he's a stand-up guy, man. He really is, man. It's a real, and he's a great storyteller, great storyteller, and real smart. And you know, he's really like a guy who, who gives his heart. He's a born again Christian, comes from a great family, like you said, twenty four seven. You see a man how he operates, how he lives, and I see how he lives. You know, he talks the talk, but he walks the walk, man. This guy, so. Uh, Again, I don't know what's going on between them, and I can't speak for Sammy because I don't know Sammy at all. But I know Michael, and Michael is just a great guy. Just a stand-up, solid guy, man. Definitely, definitely. But it's kind of weird, Joey. Do you find that weird? I mean, you got to admit it, Joey. You have a podcast, I have a podcast. Sammy the Bull, 19 Murders, has a podcast. <laughs> I mean, do, do you find, I, and, I, and I find that, do you, like, wow. Like, this country, no matter what you do, you got a shot to make it somehow. Think about that. He did his time. He, he did his he time. He did more than enough time. He yes. His, he did time for his son and the whole thing. Yeah. And if any, if you know anything about Sammy, he's fucking very smart. Yeah, I don't know him. Oh, if no, you I read don't those, know. did you read his book? No, I did not. If you read his, I mean, listen, uh, a situation arose mm -hmm. where... I was thinking of doing a podcast with Sammy. Right. right. And then I had to think about my world. And I think about the people. I mean, people have forgotten about it, but some people have. That's and, what I heard. Is that true? And, well, you know, it's just some people feel like, you know. Right. And how good when my mother died, the Italians were for me, there for me. I right. can't tell you how many times. So in my heart, I felt like if I did a project like that, I would spit in the faces of the people who helped me because that's their culture and that's their beliefs. And that's the only reason why I wouldn't do it. Really? I think Sammy, yeah. I think Sammy ratted, but I think he had his reasons why he ratted. It wasn't yeah. the first thing on his mind. I think he was a real wise guy. Oh, no question. I think that everything was played against him for him to rat. But, you know, I was in the roofing business and uh, a, a construction tin cost, cost $200 in Colorado. A construction tin in New York the same tin cost two thousand dollars, and that was because of the mafia tax. That's you know nobody could build anything in 1985. Right, they didn't talk to Sammy. You know John Gotti was the boss of the Gambinos, but nothing got done. The guy ran construction projects. I talked to an FBI guy at Jiu Jitsu, and he's going to find out for me. When I told him, his face went white. He's never going to tell me the truth. Sammy was so businessy that part of his deal was the feds collecting his loan shark payments. Really? They'll deny it. Everybody will deny it. But people in Brooklyn will tell you. I yeah, believe it. For about six or seven months. I believe it. That's how much of a businessman he is. I believe when they that. they paid off the juror, he's the one that told them that's true. to pay him in segments because the guy can slip on his neck and break his neck and we already gave him 60 grand. Why do that? Let's pay. He's yeah. a very good money guy. So you can actually say he was a gangster and a racketeer. And a racketeer. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. you actually could say He's, that. Yeah. He, had a he had a company for everything. A construction company, a painting company. He had a construction. And what he'd do is, you know, again, this is Sammy. He'd blossom the business. He'd give you a shot. Sammy, let's open up a paint right, store. Right, right. The place starts making money, you're dead. He ain't paying you. So he killed most of his partners. Oh. Most of those 19 people were partners. He No way. Architects. Anybody right. who did something for him, he iced. 
Oh. He iced DB, DiBadetto. He fucking, that guy owed him $200,000. That guy owed, owned all the great, the, the, the tire shops. So he would kill his partners. He would kill his partners. And then take the business. That's out. not too cool, Fucking Joey. killed his brother-in-law. That's right. He killed his fucking brother-in-law. And I heard, he said, when he said when he was in the coffin, I remember that. I saw that podcast. He said, look what you made me do, you motherfucker. And then supposedly he cut the hand off. So he couldn't find the body, and one day he was in the house, and the dog brought the hand in from the backyard. And the dog, he killed his wife's brother over wow. money. Wow. He fucking, you know, he went, he did so many things. Like he was on the outs with Paul Castellano for a long time. Wow. Because he was fucking icy. He killed the people from the casino. What's that place in Brooklyn? You remember it? The, Gemini? The snow. The, the Plaza Lounge. The Plaza Lounge. He, he shot the guy in the eyeball. The guy came in, paid him the $3 million. He was going to take over the club. Sammy killed him before he could take over the club. I'm telling you, the guy was a fucking... But what happened was, like, when he went into the FBI, a lot of people don't know about this. He went into the FBI and he ratted. And he ratted so well. He was so articulate. Yeah, they even said though that, he was yeah. retarded. No, he's not retarded, but even though he's got, like, dyslexia. All right. He was so professional. They fell in love with him. So people would come in that wanted to turn, and they'd go, yeah, me and Sammy did this. And they'd look at each other and go, get him out of here. He's lying. That's how much they love Sammy. So 10 people flipped and would say, I sold drugs with Sammy, and they'd go, get him out of there. Sammy never sold drugs. And then it was finally they got together, and they go, dog, how can 11 people walk in here and say they were moving quaaludes with Sammy? So they had to go back to Sammy. Oh, and that's how they how. nailed Sammy was <clears throat> the last time was the Iceman. The Iceman made those tapes. Right. And he said, he goes, one time Gravano came up to me to kill a cop. Eh. When he signed with the FBI, they said, the only way we'll take you is if you didn't kill a cop. Have you killed a cop or a sanction? He did kill a cop? He, killed a, he paid somebody to kill a cop. Wow. In Bergen County. Wow. So, yeah. So, Sammy was a smart dude, you know, I mean, and I think the podcast will do great. Well, oh, yeah, because well, people will look at that. People, you know, his podcast does his, his podcast does the great. He's a great storyteller. He's a great storyteller. He put it on Patreon. You know, yeah, I think he's shooting a movie. Right. You know, anybody can, listen. The great thing about this country is everybody gets a second chance. I got locked up. Yeah. I thought my life was dead. You get a second if you really want it. If you really you want it, I agree. You make with a you. mistake. Mike Tyson made a mistake. Let, let's talk about Mike Tyson. Oh, let's this talk guy about didn't Mike punch Tyson. a guy in the face. Right. This guy didn't beat up bikers in the Bronx. <laughs> this guy raped a woman. Okay. Have you ever seen Mike when he gets on a plane? The first people taking pictures of him are white women. Have you yeah. seen Mike in an airport? Yeah. Everybody loves Mike. Yeah. Everybody loves Mike. Everybody, yeah. Everybody loves Mike Tyson. Yeah. This guy did one of the worst things you could do in, in life, right? Right. It, uh, we live in a country. He that came if, back. He came back. You have to come back, you know, arm. What's that expression? Your arm and your fucking, yeah. you know, be humble. And, you know, Michael Vick, kind of. Kind of. Kind of. They kinda, still matter. Kind of, you know, yeah. Kind of. He yeah. fucked with white people's main thing. Dogs. Dogs. You, you don't do that. that. Don't do that. But Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson came to see my one-man show, Joey, and he cried. I believe it. Chuck Zito brought him. Yeah, I believe it. He cried. And he brought him again. And he came over to me. And one thing i got to say about Mike, and I met Mike a bunch of times. And he said to me, you know, you really inspired me to do that, to do a one-person show. And nobody said this to me. A lot of people have said that when they saw my show. They say, you inspired me to do it. Nobody ever fucking does it. They say it. Nobody ever does One of the hardest things in the world is to write a one-man one show. Yes, you know that. that. All of a sudden, I hear he's doing it. He goes on fucking Broadway. Spike Lee's directing it. I see the show. It's fucking great. And I said to him, I always told him, I said, let me tell you something, Mike Tyson. You fucking did it. I respect you more for that than even all your fights because nobody could fucking do what you did. He said he was going to do it. He wrote it. He put his heart out there. Videos, custom audio all his life. It was fucking great. It was great. And he did a great job, man. And he did it. I respect the guy. I love him to death. Yeah. He's a great guy. I like the guy a lot, And man. this country's good with that. Like, now that they've implemented cancel culture. Right. And I don't even respect it. You know, you have Mike Tyson. He went in front of a judge. Right. A judge sentenced him. <clears throat> I went in front of a judge. He sentenced me. Right. Who the fuck are you to sentence me? Who the fuck are you to sentence me? Right. You can't judge me. When the fuck and, and for people and the people that are doing it are people that are saying they're woke. 
So right. you're woke, but you don't believe in a second chance. Uh, yeah, I believe in a second chance. You've got to take no everything question. from a guy and make him embarrassed right. because you say a girl 12 years ago. Now, I sympathize for her. I have a daughter. I understand. Absolutely. But you can't come back from 20 fucking years ago. There's a different time. We don't know what's going on. Well, uh, Chris Knock walked into a restaurant. He grabbed my ass. He was Chris Knock, bitch. He was on Sex in the City. I'm sure you didn't smile at him or nothing. But why would you... See, what bothers me is I don't like you come back 15, 20 can't, years ago. Can't. It's, I mean, because I think about when I was single. Okay, I didn't, I, didn't do, I didn't do anything like that. But when you're a single guy, you come on to a girl. As long as you do it like a gentleman, what, well, he was inappropriate what he said. I was fucking coming on to you. I was fucking 22 years old. What the fuck you want from me? Now, time out. He was inappropriate what he said. Now, ladies, how many guys come up to you on a daily basis and say... Can I have your number? And you're like, I'm flattered, but I don't want to. Or, hi, can we right. go out on a date and you're flattered, but you don't want to. Don't you want a guy to come up to you and say, because I'm no handsome guy, but whenever I said this line, it was to go. First man who talks loses. How about we go back to my place? I got a gram of Coke and I'll suck your fucking uterus out. You don't say <laughs> nothing after that. You just look at the bar and you turn around oh, and walk. Oh, Jesus. If they follow you, you got a hitter. If they don't follow you, everybody goes their own way. I oh. had a friend, an Italian kid with oh, blue God. eyes. Yeah. Guy got more pussy than anybody. I saw him and when he was 17 pick up a girl on the beach and take her under the boardwalk. And they came back holding hands, whistling. And they fucked in 69 <laughs> under the seaside boardwalk. And I said, enough with this shit. I got to listen to what this motherfucker's following girls. Right. He's Indian. He was Italian. But his mother had a little bit of Indian in him, so when he got drunk, he got ubats. Right. So he would tell women, like, and his eye would roll. He would, I'm going to fucking suck every pubic hair out of your pussy. <laughs> Girls want to hear that. They don't want to hear that I'm going to take you to dinner. I have insurance. <laughs> I got a 401k. Oh, You God. don't want to hear that. You want to hear, you're going to suck my asshole till you smell my liver. That's oh, what they want. I'm going to smell your fucking. I'm going to put my asshole right in your my nose in your asshole. I'm going to smell your liver. You tell that to a chick, she'll look at you. And at first, it's like this sexual harassment, but sounds like fun. <laughs> it sounds oh, like geez. fun. This sounds like fucking Disneyland here. Wow. So you don't really know how to. I know that's the only thing that worked for me. When I went up to a woman as a gentleman, they didn't want to talk yeah. to me. I like to take you. No, out. I have to admit, I was always a gentleman. Yeah, you got to be a gentleman. I, I have to. But after a while, you're thirty. You're like enough with you know. When yeah. a girl's twenty, yeah. I want a guy that's dark and you know he smells like Colombo and the bitch is thirty. Yeah, and he could be a little chubby, could be missing <laughs> a tooth, but a, well, but the a standards time, drop. A yeah, little bit. the standards yeah. keep yeah, dropping right. as you get older because yeah. that fucking prince ain't showing up to your house. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, when they're young, when they're in their early twenties, they're like the handsome guy with the six yeah. packs. But as they get older, they go, well, this guy just wants to bang me. Yeah. This older guy here is going to take care of me a little bit. And that's why I won't talk to young girls. Yeah, no. Like, listen, I didn't like, when I was 18, I still liked 29-year-old women. Right. I didn't want to hear that chitter-chatter. You, right. you, you take a Catholic girl home, she gives you a tip, you got to walk home and pat her the whole way. <laughs> She's crying. These Irish chicks, they cry on the way home. And I love Irish chicks. You know that. Right, right, right. I love Italian women, but they yell too much. They yell too much. So they yell. The Irish chicks like me because I'm their father. Irish women have crazy dads. That's true. They beat the kids. They drink. They call them cocksuckers. They drink. They drink. So the only women who ever wanted to have anything to do with me was Irish chicks. I'm cool to Irish chicks. They're like, he's okay. He's like my dad. Right, well. Even my wife says it to me. She's like, he's becoming my dad. <laughs> oh, Holy God. shit. I really? love Irish women. Yeah, they got dirty feet. <laughs> they got that little dirt on the heel, you know what I'm saying? Like when you go to fucking, what was the porno chick on 42nd Street? When we were kids, you go in there, space land, sex land. Sex land. You went in there, the thing opened up, and you put your head in the thing, oh and you would suck God. the tip for like a quarter. But if you didn't put a quarter <laughs> in the slot, the thing shut on your window. I have a friend, Paris, he's a cop in San Diego. Right. In the eighth grade, we play hooky, we went over to sex land. The window caught him. We walked out like we didn't know nothing. We just walked out. <laughs> it was a circle with rooms. Right. The guy would walk out, Dante, tremendous. And a guy would come in with a bucket with hot water, and you're free to go in there, and your feet would be sticky and shit on the oh, way in there. Oh, God. And it'd be like, I would take the, the the bus into the city, and I'd come out of Port Authority maybe quarter to eight, and I would see the Hasidic Jews walking into sex That's land right. By the fucking dozens. Yeah. And at 8 a.m., it was the chicks that were hooking, and they're just coming in for like one last $20. So it would be like a rotating stage. 
<laughs> it'd be like a rotating stage, and this chick would be on heroin, and she'd be passed out, and there'd be some guy like banging her, and you're like sitting there, like, what the fuck is going on? What's wow. happening with my life? But I'm in here, I might as well bang one out, you know what I'm saying? So, and then this little ugly chick walking around from window to window. Do you want to suck my tit for a dollar? Do you want to suck? Because you have that little hood, so you could stick your head and just like kiss. When you're in the eighth grade, you know, you're living like a doctor. That's so. living in New York, man. That's the New York fucking experience. That's the New York experience. You're right, man. You're fucking right. So he tells me, he goes, you know, Dad, you should have brought, I mean, you know, you know you sh we should bring something to Joey. We're going to his house. I said, well, I, we can't stop now. It's too fucking late. I don't want to be so late. I go, yeah, I should have brought him like, I should, next time I come, I said, I'm going to get him some Cuban rum. Some real, nah. he, goes, he goes, Cuban rum? He don't want no fucking rum. He goes, give him out some fucking weed. I said, I'm not giving him no fucking, I can't do that. That's terrible. You don't smoke? No, I don't. I did. You did? Oh, when did you oh, quit? Yeah. Oh, years ago. My thing was LSD. I loved LSD. <laughs> my, in my thing, city? And, yeah, my thing was LSD. But be, I'm older than you, but when I took LSD in the late 60s, we used to have a fu It was really fucking strong, Joey. We used to go, I was in a band. You know, I had a long hair down to here. So we used to go to this guy's house. We all walk in. He goes, all right, guys, I made some good shit today. You have, you have an eyedropper. Like, you know, you go like this. Stick out your tongues. We roll stick out our tongues. He go, do, 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 do. and we all go, all right, man. We pay him, walk out of there. See, the thing about LSD, you know, was like, this is it for 12 hours. Eight to 12 hours, this is it. There ain't no coming down, motherfucker. Ain't no coming back. There ain't no coming back. This was it. He didn't know that I took a drug till he was about 22 years old. He used to ask me growing up, Dad, come on, you never fucking smoke pot? And I go, never, never. <laughs> when he was 22, finally, when I was started writing this book that I wrote, then I started coming out. I said, I wanted to wait till he was older because I yeah, didn't want to give him permission no, at that age. No. You know what I mean? But but no, I was, LSD, we used to spike each other, Joey, me and my friends. We used to spike each other. We could. We'd never eat in front of each other. We'd never eat because I wouldn't. And I was. I was one of the last guys to get fucking spiked. So I, I'm sitting around my friend Timmy Knapp. God rest his soul. I said, Timmy, we got to spike the guys. I said, but what is a food that nobody couldn't resist? And he goes, I don't know. He goes, should we get mozzarella? I go, no, it's too big. He goes, Oreos, Oreo <laughs> crackers. Smart. So we get Oreo crackers, Joey. So he's like there, I'm over here just like this. So I said, he goes, do you want a trip? I said, no, I don't want a trip. He goes, all right, let's just spike him. I said, okay. He goes, but I want to eat something. I go, it's very simple. The good pile's here, the bad pile's there. That's the bad pile, that's the good pile. I said, we take out of the good pile. So we're doing like, we, I'm getting the uh, purple, purple haze was the, was the fucking acid. And we grind, we smashed it all up in powder form. And we're going like this, whoosh, open up the Oreo cookie, whoosh, whoosh, right? So we, I'm putting in the bad pile. We're so fucking bad. You know this. So he ain't looking. I'm putting some of the, the bad ones in the good pile. I'm throwing them in, right? I'm throwing them in, right? So he's going like this. He's taking from the good pile. 20 minutes, 30 minutes go by. He goes, hey, Chaz, this shit goes through your hands? I said, what are you talking about, Timmy? He goes, he goes, man, I feel like I'm fucking, you know, you get that foot in your, yeah. your mouth. You know, he goes, I said, Timmy, come on, stop it. That's the good pile. That's the bad pile. He goes, I keep throwing shit in the fucking... He goes, what the fuck? He goes, something's going on. I can't fucking believe it. I'm tripping. I go, you can't be tripping. He goes, please tell me you fucking spiked me, please. I said, all right, I fucking spiked you. And he goes, oh, thank God. He thought he was losing his fucking mind. So I took some of the fucking bad ones. And I said, are you happy now? Look. So we both started tripping. We waited till all the guys come in. So everything's on top of the fucking, right, Oreo cookies. So every guy walks in, just like I said, Joey. Hey, every guy's grabbing it, taking while I'm saying, and we're fucking laughing, right? Knock on the door, open the door. It's a fucking super of the building. Older guy. He might be, back then, he must have been like 50. He walks in, he goes, hey, how you guys doing? Everything all right? You guys are okay? I say, yeah, we're okay. He goes, oh. He goes, can I have a couple? So everybody's standing there. So what the fuck are you going to... We go, yeah, yeah, go ahead. 
<laughs> he takes a fucking couple, make a long story short. We're like, holy shit, fucking Bill Bailey. His name was Bill Bailey. Bill Bailey took the fucking Oreos. All of a sudden, by the night, we, we, now we told everybody they're all fucking laughing. They're pissed off at us, but we're all laughing. We find out that Bill Bailey was power walking by the Bronx Zoo. He was walking like this. <laughs> I mean, do you know, but I, my thing was Ellis thing. We used to take that. Uh, I love that shit. I got three hits in the draw. No, yeah. no, I couldn't. Joey, they would have to, yeah. they would have to take me to the hospital right now. No, if we'll I ever took it now, seriously, I can't do it, Joey. We'll take three hits and we'll have your son drive. We'll no. go around, <laughs> Joey. We'll go down the shore. We'll go down to Point Pleasant, jump up and down. I would say, take me to the fucking hospital because shoot me up with Dorazine and just let me fucking rest. Let me tell you something. If you took this, you'd be disappointed. Yeah, it's not what we were getting. Oh, it's we'll, three hours. Three hours. Oh, this was 12, 8 to 12. This is three hours, maybe a two-hour lapse afterward where you see like a streak or something. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You feel something scratching your neck, but it's not yeah. what we were getting. They don't have I used yet. to look in the mirror. I used to look in the mirror. Oh, like, yeah, and everything melts. Everything melts. I used to go, that's right. I used to grab my nose and it was like right off my face, my eyes. I, I remember sitting in a chair. I remember when I went to this party once. It was like 9 o'clock at night. I'm sitting in a chair. I slow, I, the time was right there. It was at 9 o'clock. I went, oh, fuck, 9 o'clock. All right, man, come on. We got to go. It was a great party. I look up. I see the ceiling going like this. <laughs> <laughs> fucking breathing. And I went, yeah, man, that's cool. All of a sudden, I look down. And all of a sudden, I turn back and look at the clock. It's fucking 2 in the morning. I said, how the fuck did that happen? Four hours fly. They fly. Hours fly. Hours fly. The, the ceilings where the things would fall from? Yeah. I remember one the time, that's the same thing, because the popcorn, they go like that, and then if a thing happens to fall, you start thinking the whole roof yes. is going to fucking fall down. But you you get these fucking things. It was like, and and sex was like off the fucking charts. Well, you know, that was like when you, you and the girl both did it. I mean... Yeah, I never found a girl that could do that shit I was doing. I was doing the yeah. double red, double barrel sunshine. Sunshine, and fucking, yeah. Uh, brown dot. The brown dot window pane I did for yeah. the Stones and Foreigner in Philadelphia, and I wouldn't leave the hotel room. I was like the kid in Apocalypse. Now, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. And they're like, you got to go. It's going to be okay. Yeah. No, but, but uh, that shit was. It's good shit. I like it. Yeah, I, I won't. For, I, I won't forget that. How I, about mushrooms? Never did mushrooms. Give me diarrhea. Never did mushrooms. No, like, they give me diarrhea. I couldn't do much. I, I just never did it. I just. And the pot today is too fucking strong. And, and the pot today is strong. Too strong. Too strong. Really? Violently strong. Stronger than what we had. Yeah, we were smoking Mexican gold, red, eighteen. No, black maybe, dungy. Black dungy, maybe fourteen percent. Right. This shit now is 37, 40. Really? They have that shit you could smoke with a fucking blowtorch. I don't do none of that stuff. Yes. I just smoke pot. That's it. Yeah. I can't. I don't drink no, no more. No, I haven't gotten high since the 70s, man. I mean, I just said, boom, that was it. I just don't do anything, man. But I remember this guy came in. To, we, I was living in St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands with the band. And the guy said, hey, I got some opium. I said, opium? He says, yeah, want to smoke some opium? I said, I, said, I don't know. I never smoked opium before. He goes... And we're all sitting around, we're all like, we said, yeah, let's give it a shot. It's all right. So I said, uh, anything you want to tell me? He goes, yeah, where you smoke it, that's where you'll be. And I went, oh. I said, come on. I said, I fucking, we get high. I said, give me the fucking thing. I took a few hits. Joey, I leaned against the wall and I went, I started sliding down the wall. And I fucking stayed right there. It's like a dream thing. That's why they have some opium dems. I didn't realize yeah. that. He explained to me to have dreams where you just like, you know, you, you go into a, you just dream, you smoke. I, I did it once and that was it. I could never do it again. I couldn't, it scared me because LSD didn't scare me, this fucking scared me. That shit scares you. And once you start getting older, you're like, I can't, I don't want to even do that shit. Yeah, no, I, I can't. I would love to go to a Chinese thing and smoke opium and eat egg rolls <laughs> and shit, but um, that, that time passed, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I couldn't, I, I just, and especially now, I, I, I have this thing about wasted talent and I try to tell the, you know, I had this thing about telling the kids, you know, I said, look, I got high and I did it. I understand, you know, but, you know, you got to, after a while, you got to just get your shit together, man. And so. I That's know. what happened. I got my shit together and everything worked out from there. But, dog, this has been an honor having you on here. Thank man. you, Joey. Like I, I said, Bronx Tale woke me up. 
Wow. And it gave me a direction. Now I, I knew what I wanted to I, do. I am so fucking flattered that you, I mean, I didn't know that. I never knew that. But when I hear people say about Bronx Tale, you know, I hope you get a chance one day to come and see it. I am. I think I'm going to go to September 10th. Yeah. You got a show in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Uh, uh, in, 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 in Jersey. Is it September? Pennsylvania. No. Oh, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Pennsylvania. If you just go to chazpalmetary.net. Everything is up. My schedule is and on And my there. niece saw you at the St. George Theater. Oh, she Bank. came? Yeah. Oh, Not fuck. the one in Red Bank, the same. Because when she came to me and she goes, I went to see Chad. Fucking tremendous. I go, why don't you tell me? Oh, anytime you want to come, you yeah, got to let I'll me let know. You know. I love you. I love you. I'm going to give a shout guy. out to my buddy, oh. Dante, looking good. Yeah. Nice Italian smiles. He looks like something out of fucking GQ magazine. He does. I'm he very, does. You know, very handsome. And I, I always tell people, my son is an actor, singer, songwriter. Go to DantePalmentary.com. You, you read all about You hear all about him. And I'm happy he came today. I love you, cocksuckers. Thank you for supporting. <laughs> I'll be back Wednesday. Don't forget to follow the man of the hour, Chaz P. I love you. See you Monday. And now for a word from our sponsors. All right, you filthy animals. I want to thank Chaz. I want to thank fucking Mike. I want to thank Chaz. Everybody who fucking showed up today, especially you cocksuckers on a Monday morning. I love you. Listen, the joint is brought to you by Freeze Pipe. Listen, you're sitting there. You're about to watch a good movie. You're like, ah, I need a little breath of fresh air. You rip out that fucking freeze pipe. You put it in the freezer. You pack your little bong. You rip out, out of the freezer. You connect it to the bong or the bubbler or the pipe. And you fucking blast off. When you rip the hot smoke passes through your fucking frozen part. Cooling down the smoke as you inhale. Listen, your smoke will be so cold you could blow ice cubes up people's assholes. Listen, I love this fucking freeze pipe. It's tremendous. I live off the fucking pipe. It takes me to a different level. I see the devil on a daily basis. Freeze pipe cools down the smoke by hundreds of degrees, and I'm getting flashbacks of Snowmass Village, 83. And your Uncle Joey's going to take care of you on a Monday morning. Go to thefreezepipe.com, press in code Joey, and save 10% off your first order. Who takes care of you like that on a Monday? Nobody. Get your bong pipe or bubbler today. Not tomorrow, today. That's thefreezepipe.com. Pressing code Joey to save 10%. If you could smoke from it, Freeze Pipe makes it. They're about to come out with a frozen apple. Fucking tremendous. The joint is also brought to you by Manscaped. Listen, it's the fucking, the summer's coming, beach weather. You want to have your dick, balls, everything ready to go tip top. When you want to smell good, that's why you got to get the ultra, the ultra smooth package. You understand me? What are you talking about, Joey? First off, you lather up. You see where you're going with the shaving with the clear crop gel shaving gel. Tremendous. And it refreshes. It feels like you got ice cubes in that area. It's time to shave now, right? Tick tock. You use the crop shave. It's designed for shaving around the fucking kakutsa or the minkia stick. All the products are ultra smooth package of vegan, cruelty free, and sulfate free. You get 20% off your first order and shipping with code Joey. At manscaped.com. Did you hear what I'm fucking saying to you? Why do you have that clown living between your fucking legs? It looks like Bozo. That's 20% off plus free shipping with code Joey at manscaped.com. Smooth out the fellas with the relaunch of the Ultra Smooth Package from the fellas at Manscaped. Listen, everybody's going to thank you, especially your fucking nutsack. They're down there sweating all fucking day. I want to thank Manscaped. I want to thank Freeze Pipe. But I want to thank you savages for being savages on a Monday morning. Stay black. I love you. See you Wednesday.